About 15 years ago, when I, uh, when I was first starting with this whole field of philosophy of science, I thought, like many of you here maybe, that although theories change, scientific theories change, there is something unchangeable in science. And that something is the scientific method. And my initial idea was that the only thing that remains to be done is to sit down and try to explicate those criteria, just to write them down. And as I read and read more and more things, I have come to discover what philosophers actually had discovered 25 years before that, the idea that there is no such thing as a universal scientific method, as a fixed scientific method. There is no such thing. So what do you do in that situation? The question immediately becomes, why is it that we prefer the hypothetical deductive method here and not the Aristotelian medieval method there? Because after all, if everyone is free to choose her own method, chances are you're going to have your theory as the best available theory. Now I'm going to have my theory as the best available theory. Your theory will be better by your own standards. My theory will be better by my own standards. And everyone will be happy. So what do you do? The question is, is the choice of methods arbitrary? Or is there a logic that governs the process of scientific change? Is scientific change a rational law govern process. We know that theories change, methods change. Is there any internal mechanism? Is there any logic that governs this change? Another way of saying this, the same thing. Can there be a general descriptive theory of scientific change? Can we actually have a theory that explains how theories and methods change? We take this question. You can say yes, you can say no. If you say yes, this position is called generalism. And generalists believe that there can be a general descriptive theory of scientific change. A theory that explains all the transitions from one theory to the next and from one method to the next. This is the important part. Not just theories, but also methods. The accepted view nowadays is that of particularism. These guys believe that science is so disunited, that science is so diverse in different times, in different fields of inquiry, that there cannot possibly be such a thing as a general theory of scientific change. If you ask these guys, why is it that you believe that there can be no such thing as a general theory of scientific change, they normally say two things, two reasons. The first reason is that they say there is no universal and unchangeable method of science. Well, we all know that there is no such thing, but they say since the method of science is changeable, therefore there can be no general theory of science. There is a strong argument, which is not only there is no fixed method of science, but there are no universal features. Nothing is permanent in science. There is nothing universal and nothing permanent in science. So the second argument is stronger than the first one. The first one only says that the method is changeable. The second one says everything is changeable. There are no fixed features in science. So the question that I have here, why would anyone think nowadays that there, after all, there can be such a thing as a general theory of scientific change? This is the question. I'm going to give you a few examples of how methods change. And my point is going to be that there is, after all, a certain mechanism which all transitions from one method to the next share. There is the same mechanism in play. Let's take a very basic example. Suppose somebody came up with a drug, an antidepressant. Let's call it X antidepressant. How do you test it? Well, the initial attitude would be, if you don't know anything about drug testing, you'd say, well, if the claim is that the drug is therapeutically efficient, you just have to find people who suffer from the condition, like that, a group of people, not necessarily famous philosophers, <laughs> it can be anyone, as long as they suffer from that condition, and give them the drug. And if there is a notable improvement, you say that the drug is therapeutically efficient. Except that we have learned long, long time ago that there is a possibility that the improvement in the patient's condition had nothing to do with the drug itself. There's always a possibility, like improved nutrition, body's natural healing ability, improved climate, many other things. So how do you make sure that this unaccounted factors, unaccounted effects, don't enter the picture. Well, you organize the so-called control trial. So what do you do? You take two groups of patients, 
similar groups. The idea is that they are statistically equivalent. That they suffer from the same condition, pretty much the same age, the same whatever is important statistically. You take two groups of patients. One group receives the drug, the other one doesn't receive anything. So this will be the control group. And if there is a notable improvement in the first group, greater than the improvement in the second group, you say that the drug is therapeutically efficient. Except that there might be something else. Am I missing something? Hi, David, the placebo effect. A placebo effect. What's placebo effect? Placebo effect is that sometimes the improvement in a medical condition can be due to the fact that the patient is psychologically predisposed towards the improvement. So sometimes we know that when patients know that they undergo treatment, they show signs of improvement. And this improvement may or may not be actually connected to the pill itself. So what do we do to make sure that it's not because of the placebo effect, that it's actually the result of the drug itself. What do we do? Well, we organize the so-called blind trial. We organize a blind trial. Again, we have two groups of patients. This one, the first one, the active group receives the actual pill. The other group receives fake pills, placebos. The important part of this whole experiment is that we make sure that they don't know about it. In this setup, we track the progress. If the improvement in the first group is greater than the second group, we conclude that the drug is therapeutically efficient. Am I missing something here? Can this testing be further improved, you think? You could ramp it up by making it a double-blind study. Why would you do that? Because if uh, someone is administering the pill but they know that it's fake, they might give off subtle clues that they're unconscious of that might tip off the testing people. Very good. This is called experimenter's bias. When people who are in immediate contact with patients, if they are aware which group is which, they may just subconsciously give clues. Researchers are naturally predisposed towards getting positive results. We know this because there are mortgages at stake, right? They have to get <laughs> actual results. So what do you do to make sure that this experimenter's bias doesn't enter the picture? What do you do? Just as Stephanie suggested, you have to make sure that your trial is double blind. Two groups of patients. This time, you make sure that none of the researchers who are in actual contact with patients, none of them knows which group is which. They have to be blinded too. So this here is a placebo, but the researchers don't know about it. If the improvement in the first group is greater than the improvement in the second group, we conclude that the drug is therapeutically efficient. I'm pretty sure for many of you this is common knowledge. What I want you to do now is to think of this whole development from the logical standpoint. Here we're going to have our accepted theories, the theories that we believe to be the best descriptions of the world, everything that we accept at the moment. And here we are going to have our methods, our requirements, our implicit expectations, the criteria that we employ in testing our theories. Okay? Now, our initial requirement was something along the lines of the hypothetical deductivism. The requirement was a hypothesis is acceptable if some of its novel predictions are confirmed. So in our case, what was the hypothesis? The hypothesis was that X antidepressant is effective in alleviating depression. This was the hypothesis under test and we were trying to see whether this hypothesis actually works. So what we were doing? We are following the requirements of the hypothetical deductive method. This was our initial attitude. What happened next? We discovered that sometimes the improvement in the condition can have nothing to do with the drug itself. It can be due to many other things, unaccounted effects. And the moment we discovered this, we changed our implicit expectations. We arrived at the idea of a control trial. So the moment you learn that the human body may show actual improvement in a medical condition due to the improved nutrition or improved climate or anything, the moment you learn that, you understand that the simple one-group testing is not good enough. You change your expectations. You switch to a controlled trial. After that, you discover placebo effect. Once you discover the placebo effect, once you realize that the improvement may be due to the patient's psychological expectations, you switch to a single blind. And finally, the moment you discover that there is such a thing as experimenters bias, that researchers involved in a trial can give subconscious cues, which may bias the patient, 
The moment you realize that, you arrive at a double blind method, which says that the drug's efficacy should be shown in a trial that forestalls the chance of unaccounted effects, placebo effect, and the experimenter's bias. In the most simple terms, we have changes in methods which are due to changes in accepted theories. Is this clear what's going on here? So if anyone told you, why is it that you don't really employ the control trial method? Why is it that you employ a double blind trial method? You'd say, well, because we have experimenters bias, we have placebo effect. It's not a random choice, is it? The moment you accept those effects, the choice of the method is no longer random. All agree? I'm going to give you another example. Let's say my initial requirement is along the lines of hypothetical deductivism. I say that a hypothesis is acceptable if its predictions are confirmed in experiments or observations. But then we also know that we have this internal tendency to forge the results of experiments and observations. For many different reasons. Again, I keep mentioning these things, grant money running out, other things. And you just want to produce positive results. Not everyone is guilty, but we have that tendency. So what do you do to forestall the chance of this entering the picture? There's no way you can have an absolute guarantee. But what do you do to at least protect yourself to a certain degree? Is there anything that can be done here? We want to make sure that what they do is actually repeatable. That's the idea. It has to be repeatable. The hypothesis is acceptable if its predictions are confirmed in a repeatable experiment or observation. So if I had an hypothesis, let's say my hypothesis is that there are very tiny angels within quarks. Why not? Tiny little angels, such that they only manifest themselves on October the 1st, 12.30 Eastern Time. Once ever. And I was lucky enough to be there to observe that. Here's the report, 80 page report with all the photographs and everything. You say, well, this, this is not really repeatable, right? Okay, at this point I know what you're thinking. You say, well, but what about the hypothetical deductive method itself? You may get an impression that there is some sort of a hierarchy of methods and in the foundation of that hierarchy you have the hypothetical deductive method which appears to be unchangeable. What about hypothetical deductive method? It is also based on some assumptions. What are the assumptions? The first assumption is the idea of complexity. This is the idea that the world as it appears in observations and experiments is a product of some more fundamental inner mechanism. So we believe there are things that are not directly observable. This is an assumption implicit in all of the contemporary science. We believe that not everything is observable. We believe, for instance, in existence of particles forces or interactions. Nobody has ever observed them with the naked eye. You understand that? We use instruments to observe them. And instruments are based on theories. Therefore, we say, well, it's okay to hypothesize the existence of things which are not directly observable. So we believe that the world is more complex than it appears in naked eye observations. There are layers and layers and layers of complexity out there. So basically, this is the old idea that there is more to the world than meets the eye. And I think it's safe to say that this idea is nowadays implicit in the contemporary science. Can we all agree on this? Very good. The second assumption is the assumption that any phenomenon can be given many different contrasting explanations after the fact. So post hoc, post hoc means after the fact. Post hoc explanations are always possible. This is the idea that everyone might be smart after the fact. Think astrology. Suppose you have a cancer. Take a cancer. The cancers are supposed to be very family-oriented, very friendly. In the list of priorities, Korea should not be in the first place. If you're really a cancer, then for you, according to traditional astrology, family, children, those things should be number one. And yeah, I'm 35 years old and I'm not married and not, not even close. And you're not going to find two astrologers who provide the same explanation. But everybody is smart after the fact. Believe me, they will come up with all sorts of explanations. Maybe that has to do with the position of Mercury at the time of my birth, or Venus, or whatever, I don't know. But they will be able to provide different explanations. A more scientific case, a fallen apple. We've seen that this very basic case could be explained by the Aristotelian physics, by the Newtonian physics, by relativistic physics, the same fallen apple. Can we all agree that the same phenomenon can be given more than one explanation? 
Yes. Therefore, we have to understand that everyone might be smart after the fact. So what do you do in order to make sure that post-talk explanations don't crowd your science, that you don't get too many post-talk explanations? What do you do? Well, you say it's okay to hypothesize the existence of particles, forces, superstrings, whatever. As long as the hypothesis itself predicts something novel, something hitherto unobserved. So it's not just an attempt to come up with some sort of an explanation of the available data, but it also predicts something that has not yet been observed. There's no guarantee again, but at least this way we protect ourselves from forged explanations, from cooked up explanations, post factum explanations. When Einstein was trying to convince the scientific community that there is actually the space-time continuum that is capable of curving this seemingly ridiculous idea, he only managed to do that when one of the predictions of the theory turned out to be true, the prediction of light bending. The light coming from distant stars actually gets bent when it passes near massive objects, a phenomenon never observed before. First, we wouldn't tolerate unobservables if we thought that the world was composed only of what is immediately observable, right? If you thought that the world is basically simple, it's made of colors and smells and tastes, you wouldn't really tolerate unobservables, would you? The moment somebody came to you and said, you know, I, I believe in the existence of molecules, you would say, oh, it's just, just ridiculous, what molecules? It's all smells and colors and... The reason why you tolerate that, because you believe that the world contains layers and layers of complexity. And we wouldn't need any novel predictions if there weren't the risk of post hoc explanations. If any phenomenon only allowed one and only one explanation, then you wouldn't need confirmed novel predictions. So you see how we arrive at the hypothetical deductive method? The moment we accept those fundamental premises, the principle of complexity and post hoc explanations, we arrive at the hypothetical deductive method. One thing we have to appreciate since those principles are changeable, these are synthetic propositions, we understand that, there's nothing self-evident about them. So therefore, these principles are changeable. The world could have been otherwise. Since these principles are changeable, so is the hypothetical deductive method. Suppose for the sake of argument, 100 years from now, somebody comes up with a theory which tries to convince us that the world is actually made of only sensations, smells, tastes, that everything else that we thought we've seen, molecules and atoms and quarks and leptons and all other things, is just an illusion. In reality, there's just smells, tastes, and nothing more. It's not very believable, given the current state of affairs, but can you imagine such a theory? Now, suppose for the sake of argument, somebody comes up with that theory. There's only one way it can be accepted, when it provides confirmed null predictions. And suppose for the sake of argument that it does provide confirmed null predictions and becomes accepted. Scientists of the 22nd century, they believe that there are only smells, colors, tastes, sounds, and nothing more. In that world, you wouldn't be allowed to hypothesize any further. You wouldn't be allowed to hypothesize any internal structure because this would be the end of it. This would be, well, the world is not really complex. The world is just as it appears in observations. That's it. You see, your method would change again. We don't have to hypothesize, we just can look back to the history of science. 400 years ago, the Aristotelian medieval method had nothing to do with confirmed novel predictions. It was based on two assumptions. The first is the idea that everything in the world has a nature. And a nature is that one property that makes the thing what it is. So let's say you have an acorn. What is the nature of an acorn? It's the capacity to grow and become an oak tree. That's what defines an acorn. So if you have an acorn that is not capable of growing and becoming an oak tree, it's not much of an acorn, is it? It's true by definition. That's what characterizes an acorn. How about lion cubs? What's the nature of little lions? Well, probably to grow and become full-fledged lions. That's what they do. And finally, what's the nature of a human being? Socrates here, a typical example of human being. So what is it that characterizes a human being? Capacity of reason. Arriving from one set of propositions to another set of propositions. Rational thinking. 
So this was the idea. Everything has a nature. The second assumption was that an experienced person, a person who is actually experienced with certain types of things, is in a good position to have a correct intuition as to the nature of a thing. So an experienced person can actually grasp the nature of a thing under study. So in this case, Socrates can say that the nature of an acorn is its capacity to grow and become an oak tree, the nature of a lion cub is to grow and become a full-fledged lion. And the same applies to everything. So basically, if you want to know what a thing is, you go to an experienced person. Because that person would be in a position to have an educated intuition. So this is not a blind intuition, okay? This is an educated guess. If you accept these two assumptions, there is only one step to the Aristotelian method. A proposition is acceptable, either if it's grasped by an experienced person, grasped intuitively, or if it's something that is strictly deducible from other propositions. Again, as we see here, our expectations here follow from our beliefs about the world. Is this clear, this example? Let's sum it up. A method becomes employed only when it is deducible from other employed methods and accepted theories of the time. So when is it that we employ certain methods? When it is deducible from our accepted theories and maybe some other methods. This, I believe, is a general pattern. Give me any case of method employment and I'll be able to show you that it was based on some tacit or explicit assumptions of that particular community. Any method you want. Hypothetic deductive method, we have it. Aristotelian method, we have it. Think of any method you want and that method will be a deductive consequence of the theories and other methods accepted at the time. And because this is a universal feature of science, we call this a law of scientific change. And it even has a number. It's the third law of scientific change. This is the law of method employment. What are the other laws? Let's start with the first law. An element of the mosaic maintains its state in the mosaic unless replaced by some other elements. I'm going to explain. The second law, in order to become accepted into the mosaic, a theory is assessed by the method actually employed at the time. The zeroth law, at any moment of time, the elements of the mosaic are compatible with each other. This is the law of compatibility. It says that the theories that are part of the same mosaic are always compatible. But what makes two theories compatible? To understand this, we have to appreciate the structure of a method. When I say a method, what do I mean? It's basically a set of requirements that we employ in theory assessment. We know this. From the logical point of view, a method can have three different types of components. It can consist of three different types of criteria. The first and the most obvious are the acceptance criteria. A set of criteria employed in deciding whether a theory is acceptable. In addition, there are demarcation criteria. These are the criteria that decide whether a theory is scientific or not. And finally, in addition to these two, there's a third type of criteria, which we call compatibility criteria. And these are the criteria that help us decide whether any two theories are mutually compatible or incompatible. So this is what we have. This criteria here, we employ this to tell whether a theory is scientific or not scientific. The fact that it's scientific doesn't make it acceptable. We have superstring theories, which we believe are scientific, but are not accepted. You understand these are different, right? A theory may be scientific, but not necessarily accepted. This criteria here, we employ this criteria to determine whether a scientific theory is to be accepted. And finally, this ones here, we employ this to determine whether theories are mutually compatible or incompatible. The important point is, since methods are changeable, and we know they are, so are the criteria of compatibility. They're also changeable. So two theories, considered compatible today, may turn out to be incompatible tomorrow. Even nowadays, our attitude towards compatibility and incompatibility depends on many different things. We don't have to really delve into the history of science to appreciate this phenomenon. I'm going to give you a simple example. Let's go to formal science. We are in the field of mathematics and the famous four-color theorem. This is the theorem that says any plane separated into contiguous regions requires no more than four distinct colors to color all the regions so that no two adjacent regions have the same color. Basically, the idea is four colors are sufficient to color any map. 
Now I'm going to give you a hypothetical case. What would happen if we came across a map that is shown to require more than four colors to color? Suppose there is a map M that requires five distinct colors to color, like that. Suppose this were actually the case. Just for the record, this is not actually the case. It is possible to color any map with four colors. This was one of the suggested anomalies, one of the suggested refutations. But suppose for the sake of argument that we study this case, and really there is no way to color it by using only four colors, that it requires at least five. How would you react? If this were really shown to be the case, then we would declare the four color theorem void and the deduction would be void. We know that the deduction is not straightforward. We used a very complex computer algorithm to prove it in the first place. So you'd probably say, well, there was probably something wrong in, in the algorithm or in the deduction itself. So this one instance would be sufficient for us to reject the theorem. And the reason why we do this is because in formal science, we are inconsistency intolerant. There is no tolerance towards inconsistencies in formal science. Why is that? Well, because in formal science, we believe that every established proposition is absolutely true. The moment you believe that everything you have must be absolutely true in formal science, and we know that that's the case, then one counterexample is sufficient to question all the deductions. The moment you establish that, then theorem would have to go. Let's take another example, this time from empirical science. Kepler's first law. The trajectory of every planet orbiting a star is an ellipse with the star at one of the two foci or foci, whichever pronunciation you prefer. Basically, the idea is that every planet revolves in an ellipse. Now, suppose for the sake of argument that we came across a planet that does not revolve in an ellipse. Suppose we discovered a planet which has a weird H-shaped trajectory. How would you react to this? What would you say? What's your natural instinct tell you? Danny, you want to try? Before rejecting it, since it's not a formal science, I would check if there are any other unexplained variables that we do not look at. For example, there might be something in that hole there that's causing it. Danny is right. We're not going to rush to rewrite all our textbooks immediately and reject the Kepler's law. We're going to, first and foremost, question our observations, question our calculations. We're going to come up with all sorts of hypotheses. Maybe there's a second star, which we haven't yet discovered, or maybe there's a small, tiny black hole. God knows what. There can be many, many different things. But we're not going to reject the law. And why is this? Because in empirical science, we are inconsistency tolerant. So what makes us inconsistency tolerant in empirical science? This is what we seem to be saying. We say that two analytic propositions are compatible only when they are mutually consistent. So if you have two propositions in formal science and they are inconsistent, there's a contradiction, then they cannot be compatible. They, you cannot accept both. You have to choose. So it's either the four-color theorem or the anomaly. On the other hand, two synthetic propositions, empirical science, might be compatible even when they are mutually inconsistent, even when there is a formal contradiction, just like in the case of the H-shaped trajectory and the general law. The two contradict each other. So from the logical perspective, you cannot accept both. And yet we do. Any empirical theory you take has a whole bunch of anomalies, which we accept, and yet we do not think that those anomalies are sufficient to lead to the rejection of the theory. Why is that? Why is this discrepancy? In formal science, we are intolerant towards inconsistencies. In empirical science, we are tolerant. Why is this? Think of it this way. If you believe that all your accepted theories are absolutely true, then you understand that two propositions that are inconsistent cannot be absolutely true at the same time. We understand this. So contradictory propositions cannot be both true at the same time. In empirical science, we do not believe that our propositions are strictly speaking true, right? We believe that they are at best quasi-true, that they are approximations. Think of it. So the moment that you understand that your empirical theories are not really perfect, so what do you do? Okay, this theory is not perfect, that theory is not perfect. It's possible for there to be contradictions between these theories. This is totally fine, right? Because none of these theories is perfect. You see? So this is the idea of fallibilism. Synthetic propositions can be only quasi-true. This is what we believe. They are never absolutely true. They are only 
approximations. Only analytic propositions can be strictly true. You put these two together and you arrive at this criteria of compatibility. Some time ago, I was talking to a former girlfriend of mine, we still keep in touch, this is very, very former, former girlfriend, and she confessed, she said, well, Hakob, I'm dating these two different guys at the same time. I said, well, yeah. So, okay, the moral aspect aside, why would you even do that? It's time consuming, so why, would you, <laughs> why would you do that? And she said, well, you know, Hakob, if I had a perfect boyfriend, I would stick to that one perfect boyfriend. But you see, none of the available ones are really perfect. So I, I take the best of the two worlds. And, <laughs> and this is very similar to what we do in a contemporary science. You have quantum physics, you have general relativity. Strictly speaking, the two theories contradict each other. You know that general relativity is accepted as the best available description of massive objects. How massive? Well, macro world and all the way to the mega world. Planetary systems, galaxies. The quantum physics, on the other hand, just as the name suggests, is the best available theory of minute things, tiny things. So the two theories prove to be very, very good when it comes to explaining the facts of their own domains. General relativity is good in its own domain, quantum physics is good in its own domain, except that sometimes you need to apply both theories at the same time. Can you think of an object that requires both theories? Alex, uh, stars, I mean, given the fact that they're a plasma gas, you actually, how they move Almost on the there. inside. What happens to the largest possible stars? Oh, okay, uh, black holes, a neutron black hole, stars. A singularity within a black hole. Yeah. Now, a singularity within a black hole, it's extremely massive and yet very, very minute. So you need both quantum physics and general relativity to explain that. The problem is the moment you apply the two theories at the same time, you arrive at contradictions. So we have a clear cut case of two accepted theories being, strictly speaking, in a contradiction with each other. And yet we accept the two theories because we understand that none of the accepted theories is perfect. Okay? This doesn't justify the moral decision of dating two guys at the same time. You understand? <laughs> no question. My name is Ian. You're saying both of those are contradictory. Do we have an answer, a truth, that both of those contradictory... At the moment, you mean? Yeah, like at this we, moment? We do not have. We have a theory that we pursue, super string theory, which we hope will solve at least some of the contradictions. But at the moment, we keep accepting both of those theories, despite the fact that they contradict. And this is the key idea of the zeroth law. If you think about it, what the zeroth law tells you is that compatibility should not be confused with consistency. They may or may not be consistent. And by the way, this law is by, currently is a, is a good friend of mine, he used to be one of my students, Rory Harder. He is the author of this law. Initially I thought every theory should be consistent with every other theory, but then if you know a little bit of history of science, it turns out not to be the case. And he modified the zeroth law. He brought the zeroth law to its current form. This is what he did. The second law in order to become accepted into the mosaic of theories assessed by the method actually employed at the time, this is basically a tautology. This is something that follows from the definition of employed method. So when I say that in order to become accepted into the mosaic, a theory must satisfy the requirements of the method of the time, not the methods of the past, but the current method, what am I saying really? If you want to convince the community, you have to meet their implicit expectations, which is the same as to say you have to convince the community. This is a tautology, isn't it? We only need this law in our future deductions, and that's what we're going to do. This law, on the other hand, this is the law of scientific inertia. This is the law that says, once in the mosaic, the theory or method stays in the mosaic unless replaced by some other elements. Now, let's see what follows from this. If you take this as your starting point, then you can say that an accepted theory remains accepted unless replaced by other theories. This is the first law for theories. Then you take the zeroth law, the law of compatibility, put them two together, and you arrive at the theory rejection theorem. Let's go step by step. You have an accepted theory. It remains in the mosaic. It doesn't need anything else to remain. There's just scientific inertia. How can it be replaced? How can it be pushed out of the mosaic? There is only one way 
And that way is suggested by the zeroth law, the law of compatibility. There must be some other theory that is incompatible with this theory that gets into the mosaic and pushes the previous theory out of the mosaic. That's how theories become rejected. Let's consider a hypothetical case first. You have theories, you have methods. Let's say you have three theories and a method. These three by the zeroth law are compatible. That's why they're part of the same mosaic, right? And then you have a contender theory, theory four that has just been proposed, it's not part of a mosaic. Question, should this new theory be compatible with every other theory in the mosaic? It's not in the mosaic. Should it be compatible with each and every element of the mosaic at this moment? Not necessarily so. It's a new theory, so chances are it comes to replace one of the theories in the mosaic. So it may turn out that it is incompatible with theory one, let's say for the sake of argument. How does it get into the mosaic? By the second law, it must satisfy the requirements of the method of the time. So the moment it satisfies the requirements of the currently employed method, it becomes accepted into the mosaic, and this theory here, which was incompatible with the new theory, becomes rejected. And the compatibility is maintained. Let's take an actual historical case. Aristotelian physics, it follows from that physics that the Earth is a sphere and that it has to be in the center of the universe. Geocentrism. In the center, and it has to be spherical. Both of these propositions follow from the Aristotelian physics. And the method of the time was Aristotelian medieval. Then we had the Cartesian physics, which had to satisfy the requirements of the method of the time. And that's what it did. Then it became accepted. It was incompatible with the laws of the Aristotelian physics. Therefore, the Aristotelian physics would have to go. It was also incompatible with geocentrism because it follows from the Cartesian physics that planets revolve around stars, not the other way around. So this had to go, it was replaced by heliocentrism. But this one, this one remained in a mosaic because it followed from the Cartesian physics, that the Earth is spherical. It, that didn't change. So basically, we take each and every proposition individually and see whether the new theory is compatible or incompatible with those things. And everything that is incompatible is being cut out of the mosaic. Okay, another interesting theorem, this is what we call contextual appraisal theorem. On the one hand, an accepted theory remains accepted unless replaced by other theories. This is a law of inertia for theories. It tells us that a theory is only assessed when it tries to enter into the mosaic, not when it is already in the mosaic. So when you come across people who try to convince you that, you know what, your accepted theory is no good, the only thing you have to say, well, it's already in the mosaic. What do you want to say? Do you have any replacement? If you don't have anything better, then what do you want to do? Want me to abandon this theory, remain with nothing? Is that what you want? Now, the second law tells us that in order to become accepted, the theory must satisfy the actual requirements of the community. You put the two together, and it is obvious that the theory assessment is an appraisal of a proposed modification. So basically, what we assess, we have a new theory. What does this new theory do? It in a sense, proposes a modification to the mosaic, right? That's what a new theory does. It says, well, I'm going to enter into the mosaic, assess that, assess that modification. That's what a theory assessment is all about. And it happens with the method employed at the time. Not the method of the past, not some ideal method that you have in mind, but by the actual expectations of the community of the time. You say, well, how come this is a very simple theorem? We call it contextual appraisal, meaning that you have to take the historical context into account. Why would anyone bother even proposing this theorem? I would have never bothered if it hadn't been for many mistakes in both popular literature and unfortunately also in professional literature. I'm going to give you a few examples. Let's take a timeline. 1945. This is roughly the year when the so-called modern evolutionary synthesis was accepted. You all know the theory. This is the theory. Okay. And then it goes all the way. <laughs> so this is the theory, and this is the theory that we currently accept as a scientific community. Now, you know what happens these days. These days we have the so-called creationists, which use the incompleteness of the fossil record to criticize the evolutionary theory. You all know the story, intelligent design. Nowadays they're not allowed to use the term creationist, so they change the name to intelligent design. The same, essentially the same idea. What is their major argument? What is it that they're trying to say? They say, well, your fossil record, evolutionary tree, all the species, living and extinct, there are serious gaps 
There are serious gaps. Now, if you understand the contextual appraisal theorem, you also understand why this is wrong. Let's have a look. This is what the theory says. Mankind and all life on the earth were created by God within the last 10,000 years as distinct, fixed kinds ex nihilo. And ex nihilo means out of nothing. This is the classical version of the theory. I believe nowadays not many people subscribe to this particular version, but let's stick to this one for the sake of argument. So this is the creator here. Everything was created by the creator ex nihilo, fixed species, no evolution. They also say that all those fossils that we happen to find in geological strata, all those fossils were deposited by God during a flood which covered the entire earth, you know, to make the life of scientists more fun, I guess. <laughs> you know, what else would we do, right, without fossils? <laughs> Essentially, what's wrong here is that their conception can never become accepted unless it manages to satisfy the contemporary requirements. What are those requirements? Hypothetical deductive method? Confirm normal predictions? So this negative criticism doesn't do anything. They do not understand that all theory assessment is contextual. The mere fact that you manage to come up with some sort of a post factum explanation of all those phenomena that we observe, this is not enough. How do you make this theory accepted? Well, there's only one way. Satisfy the requirements of the time. I'm not saying they have uh, much of a chance. They don't. But the only chance they have is to stick to the contemporary requirements and understand that their theory is not accepted, there is an accepted theory, want to convince the community, well, convince the community. It's almost a tautology. Let's take another case, going back in time, 1610, heliocentric astronomy, it wasn't accepted, this is one of the proposed theories. This here was one of the novel predictions of a theory, you remember the case. And popular science mythology tells us that when the prediction of this theory was observationally confirmed. From that moment on, this theory was advantageous to the then accepted geocentric theory. This is what your popular myth tries to convince you in. When you read popular literature, why is it that people say that Galileo was treated unjustly? The reason is that those commentators, the popular science authors, they take the contemporary method of science, hypothetical deductivism, appraise that case of the past with the contemporary method of science, and say Galileo's theory was advantageous because it had confirmed novel predictions. It had confirmed novel predictions. You see, phases of Venus, that was a confirmed novel prediction. Nobody had ever observed phases of Venus before they were observed by Galileo. If they only employed the contemporary hypothetical deductive method, Galileo's theory, Copernicus's theory essentially, would be advantageous. Now the popular myth forgets that the method of the time had nothing to do with confirmed novel predictions. It was the Aristotelian medieval method that was completely different. People didn't expect novel predictions. People didn't expect confirmed novel predictions. What they expected is intuitive truth, and this theory was anything but intuitive. So essentially what they do, they anachronistically apply the hypothetical deductive method here, our contemporary criteria, to the historical case. And this is a typical case of anachronism. Take your contemporary criteria, apply to the science of the past, and declare those guys arrogant and ignorant and dogmatic. They were anything but ignorant, anything but dogmatic. If you study the actual historical records of the time, and you read the actual debate between Galileo and the Aristotelian clergy, you realize that many of the things that those guys were saying actually made total sense. Those guys were saying, you know what? your theory is not intuitive. Your theory contradicts the foundations of our physics, the Aristotelian physics. So what do you do? You want us to reject the whole system of the world? Do you have any alternative? Again, what's forgotten here, what's neglected here, is the contextual nature of appraisal. But appraisal never happens in a vacuum. It always happens in specific historical circumstances. And these circumstances were such that Galileo's theory the heliocentric theory, was not advantageous to the then accepted geocentric theory. Is this clear? Very good. Now this theorem here, which I'm going to deduce now, I think is one of the, uh, if not cornerstones, then at least one of the most important achievements of this theory that we propose. Second law tells you that you have to satisfy the actual expectations. What happens when you have two theories, 
incompatible theories, contender theories, proposed at the same time, and both managed to satisfy the requirements of the method of the time. Let's say both theories got confirmed with the same observation, same experiment. Both theories predict pretty much the same things. We have completely two completely different theories. Predictions are the same. And they both manage to convince the community that they're equally good. What happens? The second law tells us what's going to happen. You're going to have both accepted. You can say, well, Harkov, you told us the two theories are incompatible. How can they be simultaneously accepted in the same mosaic? Because we have the zeroth law that tells us that this cannot happen. At every moment of time, the mosaic must be compatible. All the elements must be compatible. So what happens here? What happens here is a mosaic split. When two incompatible theories meet the requirements of the method simultaneously, the mosaic splits in two. You have two theories, both in the mosaic, incompatible. This leads to a mosaic split. And we had historical cases when you had one community in one part of the world teaching one set of theories, another community in another part of the world teaching another set of theories. We also even had cases when two neighboring departments within the same university taught a completely different set of theories. So these things happen. This is what we call mosaic split. This phenomenon is a commonplace in the history of science. I'm going to give you the classical case. This is probably the most difficult case to be tackled by any theory of scientific change. This is the case of the so-called scientific revolution, the transition from the Aristotelian medieval system of theories to those of Descartes and Newton. 1680, the late 17th century, you have the Aristotelian system of theories. Now, how could this system of theories be overthrown? What would you have to do in order to have a chance? Danny here, one try. Uh, what we could do is find competing theories that are intuitively uh, confirmable. Danny knows his rules of the game. If you're in the 17th century, the only way to convince that community is to make sure that you have a comprehensive set of theories which appear even more intuitively true than the theories that are accepted. So you have to satisfy the requirements of the Aristotelian medieval method here. So these are the requirements. One truth about these requirements is that this requirement is so vague that it is possible for many different theories to simultaneously satisfy that requirement. We're all in the 21st century and we know for a fact that what appears intuitively true to me may or may not appear intuitively true to you, right? Now what's common sense for you may or may not be common sense to me. As a result, by the end of the 17th century, two theories, Newton's and Descartes, are shown to be intuitively true. You had two theories that simultaneously satisfy the requirements of the time. And as a result, this led to the existence of two different communities, one accepting the Cartesian set of theories, another one accepting Newtonian set of theories. So on a timeline, this is your Newtonian theory, the first law, second law, third law, law of gravity, Newton's laws, and from that he was trying to deduce as many theorems as possible. If you ever looked at the Principia, it's a famous book in which the Newtonian theory is presented, what he does, he shows that the laws make sense, and after that, he deduces a huge axiomatic deductive system. Among other things, that the orbit of every planet must be an ellipse, that every planet is an oblate spheroid, we know this, that it's flattened towards poles, and many, many other things. His system appealed to the community because it was based on seemingly intuitive axioms and deduced theorems. So if you look at the structure, forget about the content, forget about what he was trying to say, look at the structure. He was trying to create a theory that would appeal not only to his contemporary fellow physicists who didn't care about the Aristotelian stuff, but also it also appealed to the Aristotelians. The same can be said about Descartes. A similar system, completely different content, but a similar structure. You have seemingly intuitive axioms and deduced theorems. Again, this may be considered as an attempt to satisfy the requirements of the community of the time. The content is different, but the two theories are trying to accomplish the same thing. They're trying to convince the community where Galileo failed. So I'm going to take this theory method diagram, I'm going to flip it like that. All the way until the end of the 17th century, you had the Aristotelian medieval theories and the Aristotelian method that was a deductive consequence of those theories. You understand, by the third law. Okay? 
And what happened by the end of the 17th century, two theories managed to satisfy these requirements and a mosaic split took place. So here, the early 1700s all the way until the 1740s, you had different communities in Britain and on the continent. On the continent, for the most part, they accepted the theory of Descartes and his followers. They were Cartesians. So if you went to Paris University around 1720, for instance, you would see that they actually studied Cartesian physics. And if you went to England the same time period, you would see that they studied Newtonian physics. Voltaire spent a number of years in England in the 1720s, and he wrote his famous English letters. Some of those letters, I think number 15, 16, they specifically refer to these differences between the Newtonian worldview and the Cartesian worldview. As, as a Frenchman, he was an educated Cartesian. But by the time he went to England and came back, he was no longer Cartesian. He was convinced that it's the Newtonian theory that's the right one. But anyways, the interesting part is how he compares the two things. He says, well, while we here believe that the whole world is a mechanism and everything happens just by actual contact, those guys over there across the channel in England, they believe that things actually attract each other at a distance. While we believe there is no such thing as empty space, that the world is full of things and everything is actual mechanism, you know, clocks, levers, springs, what have you in a clockwork. Guys over there in England believe that it's just masses and attraction. Two completely different worldviews. What happened after that? This is the key part. The moment you accept any of the two theories, Cartesian, Newtonian, doesn't matter, your fundamental method of science undergoes a transition. Now I'm going to show you how you arrive at a hypothetical deductive method the moment you accept any one of these two theories. At this moment you understand why these two theories became accepted. Now what remains to be understood, how we arrive at the hypothetical deductivism the moment we accept any of these theories. This is what I'm going to show. I'm only going to take Descartes' theory, but a similar deduction also takes place in the Newtonian theory. I'm going to explain that one in lecture 9 when we get to the Newtonian worldview. But today, Descartes' theory. A fundamental principle of this theory is that matter is extension. We covered this. That everything out there, everything material, has only one attribute, that is the capacity to occupy space. If you accept this, it follows that any phenomenon can be produced by an infinite number of different arrangements of parts. I'm going to explain that. Let's take three watches, absolutely identical from the outside, so the same phenomenon. You can trust me, I just copy-pasted the same image, so they're absolutely identical from the outside. And yet, it is conceivable they may have completely different arrangement of parts. This is the idea. You have to appreciate that the same effect upon your senses can be produced by a different arrangement of parts inside. Another thing that we have to take into account, that all other qualities like color, taste, weight, all other qualities except the extension, all other qualities result from the combination of these material parts. So there are no actual colors out there, there are no actual smells out there, there are no actual tastes out there. It's only moving parts, right? That's the only thing you have. So all the effects upon your senses, they are products of the combination of different parts. So colors, for instance, let's say the white color would be some combination and the black color would be another combination of parts, right? If you accept this, then it is possible to provide an infinite number of different postdoc explanations to everything, right? You get the same phenomenon, then you sit down and hypothesize, okay, what could have possibly produced this phenomenon? I can come up with my hypothesis, you can come up with your hypothesis, and we can have an infinite number of hypotheses. This brings us to the idea that everyone might be smart after the fact. You see the deduction here? Very good. And if you accept this, then you also accept implicitly the idea that the world is more complex than it appears in observations, that the world is not just about smells and colors, that there are other things, particles, parts, that they can be different kinds of arrangements, they can be anything, as long as they're material and occupy space. The rest is obvious. You have these two principles, you put them together and you arrive at the hypothetical deductive method. This is how Cartesians became hypothetical deductivists. Descartes himself knew this, although he didn't quite take that step. Descartes, he was never engaged in actual observations and experiments. He was a system creator. But he says in that very system, he says, well, 
although I am in a position to deduce many of the theorems of my system, when it comes to specific details, let's say the explanation of magnetism or gravity, you cannot deduce these things. You have to hypothesize these things. And then you have to test your hypothesis experimentally. The second generation of Cartesians, in particular one Christian Huygens from Dutch Republic, Netherlands, I think it's pronounced like that, it's Huygens. Hoy, clear throat, and ends, Huygens. <laughs> It's easier for me because I have the same sound in my last name. It's Barsegian. It's the same re. So Christian Huygens, he understood that this is the way to do science. So this is what we have. We have accepted theories, and by the third law, the new method here became employed because it was a logical consequence of our accepted theories. Here we are. The moment you accept any of these theories, your method, fundamental method of theory evaluation changes. And after that, you know the rest of the story. In the 1740, one of the predictions of Newton's theory was confirmed, and that's how we had Newton's theory accepted on the continent as well. You remember the oblate sphere hypothesis? It was tested already by the hypothetical deductive method. So scientists around the 1730s, they already expected confirmed all predictions. And that's the reason why they organized those two expeditions in the first place. Why else would they bother? You see, that's a good indication that they expected confirmed all predictions. They wanted to test, unlike their peers from 50 years ago. You see the transition? You see how it happens? Magnificent, isn't it? And yet completely rational, completely logical. There is no random choice of methods. You don't get to randomly pick your criteria. Very good. Let's sum it up. These are the four laws. The three of the laws are my creation. One of them is Rory's creation. And we have a whole bunch of people who suggest many interesting theorems and modification to theorems. At this moment, if I zoom out, these are the laws. This is the system we have at the moment. You don't have to go into detail, but these are the theorems that follow. So we have a whole full-fledged theory of scientific change that explains things as theory acceptance, method employment, theory rejection, mosaic split, the role of sociocultural factors, many, many different interesting things. Now, to our diagram. Should we really deny that there is no universal method of science? No. I think it's clear that there is no fixed method of science. So this argument stands. It's just it's not vital. As we've seen, the fact that there is no fixed method of science doesn't mean that you cannot have a theory on how these methods change. As for this argument, it's just not true. We've seen here that all cases of scientific change seem to obey certain logic. There is a certain pattern. This is essentially what I argue for, and this is the reason why I believe that scientific change is a rational, law-governed process. Now, we have established that the game of science obeys certain rules, certain laws. Whether our laws are correct or not, we don't know. But I can say that there are certain patterns. We know that. But this doesn't mean that we actually progress towards truth. So the fact that there are rules doesn't guarantee that we are actually getting better in our explanations of the world. Yes, we may or may not be playing by the rule book, but what makes us think that playing by the rule book is actually going to get us any closer to a more correct description of reality? So for next time, does science reveal anything about the world as it is? In other words, is there such a thing as scientific progress? I'm going to cover this next time for today. Thank you very much. Thank you.